Greetings, my name is Mark Daly. I'm an immigration lawyer with Pro Forma Immigration Attorneys. This is the fifth video in this series designed to show you how to actually prepare and file all the forms you need when you are a U.S. citizen bringing in your spouse to get a green card. So this is adjustment of status in the United States for permanent residency, a step-by-step -step guide for getting all of your immigration, the USCIS forms together, and all the documents in support of that, how to file it, and then how to go to your interview. So this next one, video five then, is I-864, Affidavit of Support, and I-944, Declaration of Self-Sufficiency. This is a controversial video, and I'm gonna be presenting this as a lawyer, I'm gonna be raising all the objections to the new requirements that have been imposed by the Trump uh, regime, uh, like some king wanting to decree uh, all of his stuff without any due process at all. So that's my little rant. I'm going to get over that. What I want you to do is I want you to fill this stuff out and crush it. We want you to get approved. We don't want you to have to go into arguing due process. We don't want to have to have you, you know, getting denied because you didn't put enough stuff forward. Right, and then having to argue on appeal that this whole thing is a constitutional sham, which it is. It's, it's offensive to ask people as immigrants to come in and prove all the stuff that they're asking you to prove. But, you know, um, it's offensive and still we're gonna go get you a green card, right? So we're gonna dive right into this and uh, do our best. So me, this is step-by-step -step immigration forms, and so we review your forms and documents over a two-hour period of time as lawyers. We help you make corrections. We get everything dialed in for you so you can send out something that's professional without having to hire us to actually represent you in your matter. When we do that, that's going to be pro forma immigration attorneys. And that is our full representation law office where we do all kinds of different cases. We work in removal. We do detention. We do family. We do business. We do all kinds of stuff. Uh, but that, what we do is we enter as your lawyer. We become associated in the case. We get copies of everything they mail you. We curate your case for you. And, but with step by step, you know, it's a good deal because we're just in and out for two hours. And uh, that's what we're doing today, basically. We also have Pro Forma does a training program for other lawyers who want to learn immigration law. And they want to get into immigration law. We have really great three-day intensives where we work one-to-one -one with a lawyer. Or one-to-two, one-to-five, whatever. But with a small group, usually just one lawyer, and take them through family, business, and then the detention removal courses to really go deep dive and learn how to do these cases. And I speak at different organizations. Here I am at the Federal Bar uh, Association, speaking on immigration law, uh, member of the California State Bar, and also a member of American Immigration Lawyers Association. So that's who I am. So our terms then, oh, one other thing I've been practicing, <laughs> I got admitted to the bar in, in 2000. I passed the bar in 1999, got admitted in 2000. And I've been practicing immigration law uh, as a paralegal since 1995. So you'll notice some irony there. You're not supposed to practice law as a paralegal. And I, I pushed the line because I was working a family business. My mom was an immigration lawyer. My brother's an immigration lawyer. I'm an immigration lawyer. But in the beginning, when we were going to law school, it was me and my brother working with my mom. And so we did all kinds of stuff. But we did it under the review of my mom. Everything was cool. But, you know, I've been working full-blown cases since 1995. Uh, terms, okay? Petitioner is a U.S. citizen. Beneficiary is the immigrant. The applicant is the immigrant. And um, the sponsor is going to be the petitioner. So when we're talking about affidavit of support stuff, we're going to be using the word sponsor a lot. Joint sponsor is the co-signer on the contract, on the I-864 contract. And then household members. That's another word we're going to be using uh, and it's everyone who's related to you who lives in the house with you. Because the idea is you're going to pitch in for one another. You're going to share money with one another so we can look to them for support for the immigrant. So those are household members. This process that we're doing, we're going to start by downloading your forms onto your hard drive. 
You're going to open them from your hard drive and you're going to fill them out and then store them on your hard drive. If you open them on the website and you fill them out and you go to save them, they won't save. So downloading the forms is what we always do. And then we get your documents together. We, there's checklists of documents. We've already given you to those. But you get all your documents together, birth certificates and all that stuff, and then your information. We have questionnaires that we use to get your information together. If your information is all in one place and all organized, your accuracy goes up a lot on your forms. So that's why we do it that way. It does take longer, but your accuracy is improved. And we don't want any delays, so it's worth it. And then filling out the forms, that's what we're doing right now. We're going to take you through the I-864 and the I-944 and show you how to fill these things out. Then assembly and filing, we're gonna show you how to package everything together and mail it out. And then the interview, we're gonna talk about the interview and what to expect at the interview. So this again, this is a spousal adjustment of status. Same-sex marriages are cool. You know, transitioned over is cool. Spouse is a legal relationship based on a marriage certificate. So if they'll marry you, then you're a spouse basically. All right, USCIS.gov, the form is where we're going, and this is the I-864 Affidavit of Support. This one's been around for a while. Um, and so we're going to look at the website info on the form. We're going to look at the form instructions. I'll show you the PDF download and the fillable form. Then we'll move to the 944, Declaration of Self-Sufficiency. Again, info on the form, the form instructions, and the download fillable form. So we're going to go right over to this now with the I-864. Okay, so we start in our search engine, usually like this, USCIS.gov. Okay, and then we have our home page here, which we check is www.uscis.gov. There's all kinds of different websites that are not the official government website. You want to make sure you're on the official government website. And then you'll come up, there's notices here. Um, and you can, on the main page, you can check your case status once it's filed, the processing times, you can find offices where you want to file, learn about office closings, uh, civil surgeon, all the stuff that you need to do is all findable from here. But where we're going is the forms. Click on the forms, bring up the forms page, and we're going to dial into the forms. And we're going to the I-864, so they're listed in numeric order here. Let's see, I-864, Affidavit of Support under Section 213. All right, so we click on that. And then it gives you the alert of the court case. On February 21st, 2020, the Supreme Court stayed the statewide injunction issued by U.S. District Court from the Northern District of Illinois, affecting Illinois filers. So court information. Look how, I mean, how complicated is that? This is like lawyers have to read this stuff and I'm still kind of scratching my head going, what? You know, oh, it issued a stay. Okay. Of an injunction. I mean, this is, you know, this is crazy. Anyway, you get information about that. And then you go to the click on the page, the I-864 page. And here's the same notice about the court rule. And um, what it's basically saying is that one of the courts fought against it and they've been carved out as a possible exception. And um, the people who filed that under that case, you know, brought this for everybody. But at this point, they're the only one. So everyone else has to follow this rule, the new rules, which include the I-944. Okay, and the final rule is here. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at the the information that's on the page first which is really helpful okay number of pages all right there's 10 pages instructions have 17. the addition date is critical to know the addition date 10 15 19 you can find the addition date at the bottom of the page on the form and instructions anything earlier than this is no good they will kick it back so make sure that you're filling out the right form where to file uh, we go to the Chicago lockbox for this now again we're filing with a green card application so we're not going to use this address but um, a filing fee, there's no fee with this. It's just an affidavit of support. Checklist of required initial evidence for information. This is good. And um, for some sponsors, <clears throat> this is from the sponsor side of it. And it's got basically what we've told you in the uh, checklist that we, co we covered already. 
and special instructions. Yeah, give the completed form and supporting documents to the immigrant you are sponsoring to file with their form OF-230 or form I-485. That's what we're doing, the I-485. If the National Visa Center mailed you this form to complete, which they will, because if you're going to go do green card, not green card, but permanent residency immigrant visa processing at an embassy, you still got to fill out this form. They're going to send it to the embassy, right? And then the embassy is going to give the instructions on how to submit it. Sometimes it's scanned and uploaded. Um, sometimes it's mailed in. And those are the special. And then you have related links which are more in-depth dive into affidavit of support law and issues. So it's pretty well organized. I got to give them that. All right, to the instructions now, form I-864. Okay, so I'm going to open this up like this. All right. The purpose, this affidavit is required for most family-based immigrants and some employment-based intending immigrants to show they have adequate means of financial support and are not likely to become a public charge. So adequate means is like kind of looking into the past around the money and documenting what money you guys have. Likely to become a public charge is taking benefits. So have you taken benefits in the past? Um, are, are, will the future mean that you're gonna actually be taking benefits? So is a more of a future looking assessment on this because they have the dis the discretion to say based on what we saw in the past we believe the future for you is going to include government benefits so when we're understanding why this form that's what they're trying to figure out they're trying to show that you're going to go on the welfare there in the future right so the form says um, I promise to pay back if they go for welfare the form says I will promise to pay back my immigrant that I'm bringing in if they go on welfare. That's a really kind of a contract language with a promise to pay in the future if something happens. How is the I-864 used? This affidavit is a contract between a sponsor and the U.S. government. Completing and signing form I-864 makes you the sponsor. You must show on this affidavit that you have enough income or assets to maintain the intending immigrant and the rest of your household at 125% of the federal poverty guidelines. By signing Form I-864, you are agreeing to use your resources to support the intending immigrants named in this affidavit if it becomes necessary. So <clears throat> that's pretty clear right there. That's, I mean, it is contractual language. And the contracts have been applied in court. What kind of court? Well, family law court, if I'm, a, if I'm bringing in a, my wife and I say I will sponsor her at 125% of poverty guidelines, and then in the divorce proceedings, she says I want alimony of 125% of the guidelines, you've already agreed to it. Well, what can I say about that? It's a contract. So a court can consider it as binding. So there is that aspect of this, I-864, which is intense to think about. You might want to talk to a lawyer, another lawyer. See, I do immigration law, so I can't really talk too much about what would happen in a state law, how this would be applied in a divorce proceeding or as for alimony or support. So that's a different lawyer to talk to. You need to talk to one of those kind of lawyers. The submission of this affidavit may make the sponsored immigrant ineligible for certain federal, state, or local means-tested public benefits because an agency that provides mean-tested public benefits will consider your resources and assets as available to the sponsored immigrant when determining his or her eligibility for the program. That's clear. If the immigrant sponsored in this affidavit does receive one of the designated federal, state, or local means-tested public benefits, the agency providing the benefit may request that you, yes you, repay the costs of those benefits. The agency can sue you if the cost of the benefit provided is not repaid. Not all benefits are considered as means-tested public benefits, and that's true. See Form I-864P, Poverty Guidelines, for more information on which benefits are covered by this definition on the contract. We'll go over that. Who needs to submit the Form I-864? Okay, 
immediate relatives of U.S. citizens right here. So family-based preferences, employment-based, so everyone. Are there exceptions? Yes, there are plenty of exceptions. We've talked about those already. And, um, but everyone in this category of sponsoring a U.S. citizen spouse is definitely going to follow one of these. Biometrics talks about this, translation, how to fill it out. Okay, basis for filing the affidavit of support. You know, is starting, what's the relationship here? And then um, joint sponsor. Either only joint sponsor or two joint sponsors. So if you're doing joint sponsor, you're going to check this box and you'll be filing the exact same I-864 as the sponsor. And of course, the joint sponsor comes in when the, when the sponsor does not have enough to cover. So if you're not making enough income, you can get a joint sponsor, someone who is, and they can step into your shoes and help you out. If there's only a small gap, then that joint sponsor just has to make up that small gap. But usually if you get a joint sponsor, you're going to want a sp joint sponsor with some deep pockets and to just settle the whole matter with uh, showing a lot of income or assets. Okay. Substitute sponsor. Okay, that's a little different. We're not going to get into that. Uh, we start with the principal immigrant inf information. And um, then we go to family members immigrating within six months. Some might be coming down the road. And uh, then information about you, the sponsor. We go into that country of domicile. So you need to be getting your uh, money from the United States. And domicile requirement means that there are employment with some other organizations that will allow you to consider that money as if it was earned in the United States. Or if you're living abroad just temporarily, uh, you can still use your income and you have property back in the United States. But domicile is an important thing. So if you show a foreign address, you're going to need to show these links back to the United States. But usually when you have adjustment of status, again, we're both living in the United States, so you know we're, we don't have this issue to come up with. You intend in good faith to reestablish your domicile in the United States. You know, when it comes up as an issue, it's usually at the embassy. It's not when you're in doing what we're doing. Okay, date of birth, location, citizenship or residency, all the standard stuff, military service. Okay, now we get to sponsors household size. And it says, add together the number of persons for whom you are financially responsible. Remember, they want an expansive view. That you need to be able to support this immigrant and anyone else that you already have responsibility for. Some of these persons may not be residing with you. Make sure you do not count any individual more than once. So they're going to have you put together your size of the household. And then they're going to look at the poverty guidelines based on that and show what your minimum amount of income or assets will be. What else do we got here about how okay, sponsors employment and income? They're going to dive into employment income. Current annual household income shows you how to, um, what that looks at with the tax return, federal income tax return information. And um, if you're self-employed, should have completed one of the other schedules. Here's a little thing on obtaining tax transcripts because tax transcripts are nice because they're certified. They're, you know that they've been issued. So a lot of times, if you don't have good copies of your tax returns, like they're not signed or something, or no proof of electronic filing, you would go ahead and get the tax transcripts. And then here's where it talks about use of assets to supplement the income. All right? And um, we don't recommend doing this. We prefer you to show income. But if you need to show assets, you have to prove uh, a lot of facts around the asset, which means that you have a bigger case, a larger case to document. Only assets that can be converted into cash within one year and without considerable hardship or financial loss to the owner may be included. The owner of the asset must include a description of the asset, proof of ownership, and the basis for the owner's claim of its net cash value. And it says here, you may include the net value of your home as an asset. Great. The net value of the home is appraised value of the home minus the sum of any and all loans secured by a mortgage, 
trust deed, or other lien on your home. So that's really basic. It's just the equity in your house. If you wish to include the net value of your home, then you must include documentation demonstrating that you own it, and a recent appraisal by a licensed appraiser, and evidence of the amount of any and all loans secured by mortgage, trust deed, or other lien on the home. And you know, here's the thing. The recent appraisal, those things can be expensive. <clears throat> so, so that's the first part of the assets. So here's the, the question on assets. And then household members' assets. So if you're marrying someone uh, or you have other people who are in your family living in the same house, you can use their assets too. But they want you to fill out a different form for that because they're stepping forward and they're pledging their assets. So they actually have to sign this form I-864A. Um, when they're going to be pledging the assets. Now, if it's just your spouse, your spouse can just list her assets on the I-864. Okay, so item 5A, 5B, household members' assets. Okay, so when you have a household member who's a relative, like a spouse, you're going to file I-864A, right? Now, if it's the asset of the intending immigrant, all right, asset of the intending immigrant, the person who I'm sponsoring, right? I-864A is not required to document the intending immigrant's assets. So I'm filling out my affidavit of support for my spouse. Her income and all of her assets that she has that I want to include with me go on my I-864. We're going to do the I-864. If I can't cover it and I need a joint sponsor, the joint sponsor's married and they had filed dual tax returns, the joint sponsor is going to file the I-864A, the I-864, and then the spouse of the joint sponsor is going to file the I-864A. That's how that works. Okay, so check this out. Item number 10, total value of assets. What this says is that if you're a U.S. citizen and you're sponsoring your spouse or child, the total value of your assets must be equal to at least three times the difference. So, if I don't have all my income together, let's say my income requirement is, uh, I have a big family, I have a $60,000 income requirement, but I'm only making 30, all right? I need to show $90,000 in assets in order to be considered for that next 30, to combine my 30 for my income, my 30 for my assets, to equal the 60,000 that's required under the Affidavit of Support Poverty Guidelines. That's how that works. So here's an example of how to use assets. If you are petitioning for a parent and the poverty line for your household size is 22,062 and your current income is 18,062, the difference between your current income and the poverty line is 4,000. In order for assets to help you qualify, the combination of your assets plus the assets of any household member who is signing form I-864A plus any available assets of the sponsored immigrant would have to equal five times this difference. Five times 4,000. If it was a spouse of a U.S. citizen, it would be three times. All right. So it wouldn't be $20,000, it would be $12,000. So that's an example of how to use the assets. Sponsor's contract, contact information, and all the rest of the stuff. Okay. And so let's jump into the form now. Here we go. show you how they get this. And I open it up and I save it on my hard drive. And then I open it up for my hard drive. Yeah, and you know, I'm just gonna I'm gonna get rid of this website one because you know you don't want to fill out a website form and then save it and it all go away. Especially if you're a baby boomer. That's really humiliating. Okay, anyway, basis for affidavit of support. I, Mark Daly, or whoever the sponsor is. I'm the sponsor submitting this affidavit of support because, right, I am the petitioner. I filed or am filing for the immigrant immigration of my relative. That's how we're using this form in this example, right? And maybe the joint sponsor is joint, but we're not going to worry about that right now. If you're filing this form as a sponsor, you must include proof of U.S. citizenship, U.S. national status, or lawful permanent resident status. So. You, we file the uh, package with a birth certificate of the U.S. citizen or passport of the U.S. citizen, and that will support this application. But you do need to prove something of the status. 
So a lot of these questions we've seen before, information about the principal immigrant there, the mailing address, country, phone. Okay, so here we go. Part three, information about the immigrants you are sponsoring. You're going to be checking yes. I'm sponsoring the principal immigrant named in part two. If they have family members that are following, you're going to click on these and list them down here. Right? But for us, we've already just named the principal immigrant in part two with all their information. So we go yes. We skip all the family member stuff unless we've got kids that are bringing in too. And then the total number of immigrants you are sponsoring on this affidavit, which includes the principal immigrant listed in part two and all the other ones, right? So uh, that's going to be one because I'm just filing for my spouse. We don't have kids yet, right? You got to put this number in like that. And then here we go about you, the sponsor. Now my name's going to go and my address. And if it's a physical address, then you can go here and lay in the rest of the information. Country of domicile, there it is. Town of birth, state, social security. Here's your citizenship or residency requirements. You might have an A number, put that there. And sponsors USCIS online account number, if any. We'll drag that over. Military service to be completed by petitioner sponsors only. This would be applicable to me. I'm currently on active duty. No, I'm not. Okay. Sponsors household size. Now, this can be confusing. I'm going to read this slowly. You're going to figure this out. Do not count any member of your household more than once. Okay. So, that's the bottom rule. Persons you are sponsoring this affidavit. Provide the number unit in part three, item number 29. Okay. Let's go back to part three. Item 29 right there is one. Okay. And if I had a big family, that'd be more. But right now, that's one, so I'm going to enter one, if I could. Sometimes it doesn't let you enter the numbers, which is frustrating, so you handwrite it in. Provide the number you entered in part three, item I'm going to handwrite in one, and then person's not sponsored in this affidavit. Yourself. Well, definitely not me. Um, and so... If you are currently married, enter one for your spouse. Okay, but remember the first rule, don't count any member of your household more than once. And here's the, I've already counted my wife here in the one. And so having this thing then be one here, you don't want to put another one here and come up with a household of three, right? Because you'd be counting your spouse more than once. So just leave that blank. If you have dependent children, enter the number here. Again, if the, my kids are coming over, um, I'm going to leave that number here. I'm not going to list them here twice and consider them to be dependent children. These would be dependent children um, from somewhere else that I'm claiming on my taxes. If you have any other dependents, enter the number here. If you have sponsored any persons on I-64 from now permanent, who are now lawful permanent residents, enter the number here. So previous applications. And then if you have siblings, parents, or adult children with the same principal residence who are combining their income with yours by submitting form I-864A, enter the number here. Pile them all in together. Add together five and enter the household size. There you go. That's what it's going to be. Type it in if I could. Well, let me see what happens if I put one here. No. Okay, going on to sponsors employment and income. I'm employed to put a job title in there. Employer one. And um, this is your current one. Employer two, if you have two jobs. Or self-employed as a occupation. Self-employed as a attorney, whatever. Retired, unemployed, my current individual annual income is, this is the key word here, current, because we're going to look at annual income tax return, which is going to be in the past, but this one's going to be where you are right now. And how you verify current is with an employment verification letter and pay stubs. So this number is very important. This is a very important number. So my current then, let's say I'm, uh, I'm at 45000 Okay. 
Income you are using from any other person who was counted in your household size, including in certain conditions the intending immigrant. See Form I-864 instructions, right. Including the intending immigrant. So if my spouse, I would put her name here, I would put a relationship with my wife, and I would include her income here. Just like I was saying, if it's the spouse and the intending immigrant, you don't need to file a different form. You put them all together in the one form. And then my current annual in income would be all the total of those lines. And then here's where you talk about the I-864. The people listed in 8, 11, 14, and 17 have completed Form I-864A. I'm filing along with this affidavit. All necessary Form I-864A is completed by these people. You click that one there. One or more of the people listed in item numbers there do not need to complete Form I-864A because he or she is the intending immigrant and has no accompanying dependents. Hey, that's the one I would click, and I'd put my wife's name there. She's an intending immigrant and has no accompanying dependents. Federal income tax return information. Here we go. Have you filed a federal income tax return for each of the three most recent tax years? I hope to say yes. You must attach a photocopy or transcript of your federal income tax return for only the most recent tax year. So there's the must. So just the most recent one. That's the minimum, one year. Option, which we like, I have attached photocopies or transcripts of my federal income tax returns for my second and third most recent tax years. Why do we like to give them more time? Because they're using a totality of the circumstances view. And that legal standard means that any scrap that comes up can come in. So the totality of circumstances, if you want you to, uh, if you want to show, if you can show you've been making money for a long time, it's better, right? If the previous tax years have derogatory information like losses and stuff like that, you don't have to submit them. You only have to submit the one year. And in fact, I probably wouldn't do that. Uh, give more if it looked bad for me. I will want to pile up all the good stuff, unless I'm required to. So if I have to give one year and the one year sucks, you got to give it. Because okay, you don't want to make a misrepresentation. But the other elective, I wouldn't put something in my application that looked bad if I didn't have to. Then there might be this one. I was not required to file a federal income tax return as my income was below the IRS required level and I have attached evidence to support this. So, you know, if you're a student in your college, whatever, you're living on loans, uh, you're not making money, um, you're on fixed income. And so, because it's certain types of benefits, you're not required to file income tax returns or pay taxes on the money. Those types of situations, you would go ahead and click this. And then you have a letter, you would write your letter describing what it is you're going for why you didn't file the income tax return. Some people who have a lot of money don't have to file an income tax return. Um, but if you're getting a joint sponsor because you don't make enough and you actually didn't file enough money, you didn't file a tax return because you didn't even make enough money to do that, you're going to check this box right here and tell your letter of why you're going to start making money real soon and lots of it. Use of assets to supplement income, optional. Optional. We don't we don't recommend this option. We don't want to give them information. Don't give immigration information they don't need to know. Checking account information, real estate holdings, stocks, bonds. God, I don't want this information. I don't want all those stock certificates and everything going into my record. I'm going to avoid this at all costs. Uh, but if you got to do it, here's the numbers and you total them up. And we talked about the evidence, so you would just put the evidence in as well. And then for the relative and the I-864A here that would come in, you just total the number right here, right? And then the assets of the principal sponsored immigrant is optional. But if you got it, the principal sponsored immigrant is a person listed in 1A, 1C. Only the assets of the principal immigrant is being sponsored by this affidavit of support. Only include the assets. And so, again, we don't like to disclose any of this stuff. If you qualify based on the poverty guidelines, go ahead and use the poverty guidelines. And so, um, use of assets to supplement income. Here's the number and the total. All right. So now, at so this time, I want to look at the poverty guidelines. 
So we go to the poverty guidelines. Okay, so we go to the poverty guidelines. I eight six four P. Twenty twenty HHS poverty guidelines. Here it is. For the forty eight contiguous states, then they have different ones for Alaska and Hawaii. So we go to the forty eight states, and here it is. So your household size. So remember we talked about household size. We that was back here when we were looking at counting up everyone, right? Household size right here. This number, the one that I have to hand write in because the PDF is not working. So there's household size, right? If it's two, then you gotta make 21,550, right? If it's a family of eight, you need to be showing 55,150. So again, if I'm only making 20,000, then how, many, how much money do I gotta make up in either a joint sponsor or assets, right? It'd be 1,550. So the joint sponsor then is going to have to make their amount for their household size plus the extra $1,550 in order to cover you. Those joint sponsors also bound by the poverty guidelines. So um, that's how that works. And that's what household size and, and poverty guidelines are related to. Then we go to the contract. It talks about the contract. You should read this uh, and get seek legal advice if you need more information about this. The information, though, about when will these obligations end. Your obligations under Form I-864 that you signed will end if the person who becomes a lawful permanent resident based on that affidavit then becomes a U.S. citizen. The whole time they're in the green card, the affidavit is still in effect and the obligations are alive or has worked or can receive credit for 40 quarters of coverage under Social Security Act. That's 10 years. So they work straight through for 10 years. If they don't work straight through or enough for a qualifying quarter, then it just gets 10 years and a quarter, 10 years and two quarters, 10 years and three quarters, right? So you go longer and longer. No longer has lawful permanent resident status and has departed the United States. They get deported, they give up, they leave, renounce their green card, uh, then that would, that would uh, discount it, is subject to removal, but applies for and obtains a removal proceeding, a new grant of adjustment of status based on new affidavit of support if one is required or dies. Note, divorce does not terminate your obligations under Form I-864. Just saying. Okay, there's the interpreters, there's the sponsors, contract, all this stuff. You've seen it, you got to read it. But it's a, it's a significant form in terms of your rights down the road in divorce proceedings. All righty, there's the I-864. Now we're going to bounce back to the real dark form, the I-944. Okay, we go to the I-944, I-944, Declaration of Self-Sufficiency. So this is what the case is relating to the Declaration of Self-Sufficiency. We've talked about this. And so the public charge is alive, and uh, some people don't need to be subject to it. But they want you to declare your self-sufficiency. They want you to make a statement about that you're not going to go on welfare and take benefits. So let's look at this. Number of pages, 18 pages. This thing is so huge. Addition date, 10, 15, 19. Anything before that, no good. Where to file? Okay, you got direct filing addresses, but we're attaching this with our I-864 and our 485. So we're just going to send it in with the 485. And then we got the form filing tips page. Now this one is going to be good um, for this form. And it's just a lot of uh, good tips. Sticky tabs, heavy duty staples, that kind of stuff. Because you are going to have a lot of documents with this. And uh, let's see, the filing fee is zero. And um, special instructions are here. Litigation and more related links to this public charge stuff. 
what is a public charge? Well, you see, if you've taken some benefits, you're going to want to dive deep and see, oh my God, was the welfare that I took really covered under the federal welfare because it was a gift or some, you know, different organization giving out the cash grants? Those issues, they're complex. You want a lawyer to help you research this stuff because it's so intense. Okay, let's go into the instructions on the form. And I'm going to download these for sure because I want to have a record of these instructions because it's so bogus. Okay, download. Thank you. Um, yeah. What is the purpose of Form I-944? Form I-944, Declaration of Self-Sufficiency, is used by an individual to demonstrate that he or she is not inadmissible based on a public charge ground. An alien is inadmissible under Section INA if he or she is more likely than not, more likely than not, at any time in the future to receive one or more public benefits, as defined in 8 CFR, for more than 12 months in the aggregate within any 36-month period, such that, for instance, receipt of two benefits in one month counts as two months. So here's the legal standard stated right here. Now, if you look at it, it's actually pretty generous because if you're going to take something, but it's only going to be less than 12 months, like a couple months, that shouldn't knock you out because it, the standard is more than 12 months over 36 months. But in reality, if you take anything, they're going to knock you out. But if you take anything, they're going to want to knock you out. So be prepared. Who must file the, in, the I-944? We do. If we're bringing our spouse in, they got to file it. How is it used? Okay, check this out. Form I-944 is used to determine whether you are inadmissible, so you, whether to kick you out, because there's a likelihood you'll become a public charge at any time in the future. We evaluate whether you are inadmissible by weighing all the positive and negative factors. See? So here's where the negatives come in they're going to use against you related to your age, your health, family status, assets, resources, and financial status, education and skills, prospective immigration status, and period of stay. That is a wide range of stuff that they can harvest in order to knock you out in this ground of inadmissibility. You know, back in the day, they would watch the people walk down the steps, and if someone had a gimp or something, or they looked really, really super shabby, they'd be out because, you know, they had to make the determination. So this is this is one of the long-standing principles of our immigration, and we have the right to do this. We they have the right to exclude anyone for any reason, basically. Um, and within that, they have to follow the rules as they're stated. If there are rules on it, they have to follow them, right? The rules are really generous. They give them a lot of leeway. So that's why the court is saying, you know, we get it and we're going to let them go ahead and gather up negative information on people who are coming in so that they can charge them with a ground of inadmissibility because they don't want them to become uh, public charges and go on welfare. So... Even though it's abhorrent to me, and uh, I don't agree with this level of um, <clears throat> scrutiny against immigrants based on financial situation, there's no, there's no research that shows it. For one, it's not based on a real thing. There's no real thing here that would require this level of um, scrutiny. And also, there's such a risk of denying people and separating families, which is a really high interest for most Americans. Most people feel like family bonding is a, it's a, something that is inherent to us as positive as humans, to be bonded and to be able to have support and people around for emotional, psychological, and financial. But when you take the financial support and blow it so huge and give it so much weight and so much opportunity for abuse, that's not right. So I 100% hate this form, and I do not believe it. I believe it's a violation of the due process, 
and it's not based on a rational relationship to a, a stated policy. So, yeah, we, I mean, you can walk down and go, okay, that person's coat's shabby, send them back. We're beyond that now. We don't let that type of power into the hands of people who are keeping our gates for us. We want those gatekeepers to work in a bigger system with a bigger view that has geopolitical, educational, cultural, and emotional, family-based considerations as well. That's my soapbox. I'm sorry. But uh, I just had to let that one cut because I really hate this shit. Okay, 944. Uh, who's exempt? There are exemptions, VAWAs and certain people, but you're not going to be exempted if you're watching this video. Okay. General instructions. Okay. Uh, signing, validity of signatures, copies, how to fill out the 944. Okay. Now, here's the specific instructions. Legal name, A number, online account number, date of birth, place of birth, family status. We talked about households before on the I-864. So this is a similar conversation that's going on around there. You and your household members, assets, resources, and financial status. Cutting right to it. What have you got? You probably have stated this on the previous form. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've just done the income. you know, And you don't want to disclose all of your assets because... You have, you've got the income to cover it, right? So um, that's why it says your assets, resources, and financial statuses are factors USCIS considers when deciding whether you're inadmissible based on the public charge ground. So right there, if, you, if you've done an I-864 and you've got a sponsor that has already pledged and it shows sufficient income, you should be able to say, that's it. I'm not going to provide anything in this because I've already met the need. But um, they're playing a different game and they want to see your stuff. So at a certain point, you're going to have to give them your stuff. But just be careful in terms of what you give them. Because going into a, a, a public record. I mean, it's private, meaning you need uh, a court order to get access to it. But it's being held in a government database. So, so we start with household income. List you and your household members' annual gross total income from the most recent federal tax returns. Okay, income's great. And then... Um, go into assets. Provide the information regarding your assets and resources. Right? And then here's an interesting thing. If you're filing the I-944 between January 1 and April 15th of any year, and you and your household members have not yet filed the current year's federal income tax returns, submit IRS transcripts for the most recent tax year. At the time of interview on your application, officer may request the tax return transcripts for the current tax year. So in this window, you can go ahead and get it filed without having to wait to file your taxes, basically what they're saying. Additional income. So you have additional income. You can add that. Household assets and resources. And it talks about the same thing. Assets converted within 12 months. Uh, talks about cars and then evidence of this checks and savings, annuity, stocks, retirement, account, nest cash value, real estate holding, any other evidence of substantial assets that can be easily converted into cash. All right, so they want to know what your assets are. Checking and savings account, okay. Liabilities and debts. Provide a list of all your liabilities or debts. Examples of liabilities and debts include mortgages, car loans, unpaid child or spousal support, unpaid taxes, and credit card debt. Provide documentation for each liability or debt. If you need extra space to complete the section, use the space provided in April, Part 9, additional information. All right. So that's deep. Credit report and score. USCIS will, receive, will review your U.S. credit report and the credit score submitted with your declaration, if available, may not be available because you need to have a social security number to get those and most immigrants don't have a social security number until they go and get their work authorization card then they get the social security number so it's probably not available to review your financial status if it is available identify the latest credit score number all right so give it your number you can obtain a free credit report once a year under the fair credit reporting act from each one of the three major credit reporting agencies you are only required to provide one credit report from any of the three nationwide credit reporting agencies, Equifax, Experience, and TransUnion. See this uh, website for more information. 
If there are any errors on the credit report, you should provide evidence from the credit reporting agency that demonstrates that you reported the error and that the error is under investigation and has been resolved. If you have any negative history in your credit report, you may provide an explanation of the designated area of this form. Negative credit history may include delinquent accounts, debt collections, charge-offs, repossessions, foreclosures, judgments, tax liens, or bankruptcy on your credit report. Provide an explanation. Yeah. If you do not have a credit report or credit score, which most of you will not have, look at this crap. Provide documentation that demonstrates that you do not have a credit report or score with the credit bureau. That's horrible. you got to prove a negative. So how do we do that? Well, we go to this site right here. We click on the site and we go, we order a credit report. You can't do it online. You don't have one. So you go and order a credit report and say, if you can't give me a credit report, just write me a letter saying that you can't give me a credit report because I don't have a social security number. That's how you do it. So you have to apply. And then with your application, you send them a copy, the government, USCIS, of the letter that you wrote requesting the credit report and say, I don't have a credit report yet, but I've requested it. So that's how that works. Right, so we go back then, if you do not have a credit report or credit score, provide documentation that demonstrates that you do not have a credit report or score with a credit bureau. So you have to go prove the negative. You may provide evidence of continued payment of bills if there is no credit report or credit score. So that's another option then, if you've been paying bills. Then we go into bankruptcy, if you've ever filed for that. Then it wants about health insurance. Health insurance is a big deal for them. Um, and so the questions are, if you currently have health insurance, provide the following. Maybe you have government health insurance. For each policy, a copy of each policy page showing the terms and types of coverage of an individual's covered, or letter on the company letterhead or other evidence from your health insurance company stating you are currently enrolled in a health insurance and providing the terms and types of coverage. Because you could be, once you're married, you could already be put on the uh, benefits of your spouse who's actually working if they have health benefits. And if they don't, you should definitely get some health insurance. Absolutely. If you're married to a U.S. citizen, you're living in the United States, you should definitely get some health insurance. The latest form, 1095B, health coverage, 1095 employee provided health insurance offer with evidence of renewal of coverage for the current year. Health insurance card is insufficient without effective and expiration dates. So if you're going to give them a copy of the card, it's good to do that, but make sure it's got dates on it. If you answered no to item 15, presumed item D, then there's more stuff about whether you receive tax credits, um, provide the annual amount of deductible or annual premium of your health insurance, indicate the date when your insurance terminates or when it must be renewed, provide documentation, indicate whether you have enrolled or soon will enroll in health insurance, but your insurance coverage has not yet started. So for couples who have just gotten married, this happens a lot. If you answer yes, provide a letter or other evidence from the insurance company showing you have enrolled in or have a future enrollment date for a health insurance plan. The letter or evidence must be, include the terms, the types of coverage you are individual covering the date when the coverage begins. And then if you answer no, you may provide information on how you plan to pay for reasonably anticipated medical costs. If you have federally funded Medicaid for health insurance, please include the benefit. And then, um, then they talk about the medical exam and they're going to see if you have a medical condition which could knock you out. And then they can say you may provide any documentation that may outweigh any negative factors related to a medical condition, including but not limited to information provided by a civil surgeon or panel physician on a medical examination. So if you have a disease or a condition that pops up, uh, like an autoimmune disease or something like that, then you can get a doctor's letter saying that what kind of work you can do. You may also provide an attestation from your treating physician regarding the prognosis of any medical condition and whether this medical condition impacts your ability to work or to go to school. You may also provide evidence of sufficient assets and resources to pay the cost of any reasonably anticipated medical treatment. So. 
Yeah, uh, if you know, if you have a medical condition, you're going to need to prove how you're going to pay pay that going on, especially if you don't have insurance. Okay, public benefits. So this is all looking back now. This is about people who have taken public benefits, and you know, the public benefit question is so complex. I would say this would be a red flag for you to have to call an attorney and get advice on how to deal with this. But certainly by going through this, if you've taken public benefits, you can go through this form and isolate down how to get the information to present to them. And then you will have arguments one way or the other. But it, this, I'm, I'm going to skip this right now because there's a lot of information here about the types of benefits and what they are and exemptions blah 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 we're just gonna you know get through this here's the documentation right so it's giving you all the information so again it really does show you how to prepare this package for submit submitting but you're going to want to get some guidance from a lawyer on the big picture of how it's going to impact your case and what you can do to mitigate it withdrawing a public benefit application okay that's going to be one thing you might do to mitigate it, withdraw. Uh, and then applications of receipt of immigration fee waivers. You know, if you've gotten fee waivers in the past, that's going to be relevant to the fact that you won't come in and gravy training already. You're already a burden, right? Then we go into education and skills. All right. This is a whole nother slice of the pie, which is huge, right? But this is a way, though, that you can really be creative in terms of, you know, pumping up your resume, making you look good. Uh, being creative with the types of work experiences you've had and the value that it would give for uh, for doing that type of work, you know. So with certain education and skills, there's certain jobs you qualify for, and those jobs can be found on the ONET, and the ONET provides an hourly wage estimate, and they are government figures. So when you're doing education and skills, then if you really want to prove what your skill can do for you financially, then you're going to want to do this. You want to go to ONET, O-N-E-T. ONET online, there it is, the onetonline.org. You go to ONET, you put in your, what have I done? How about a chef? All right, chef and head cooks. Okay, ooh, cooks private household, cooks restaurant. Okay, yeah. Well, let's go with, I was actually a chef and a head cook, all right. So here's the description of what I've done, right? And we just scroll down and we see what are the wages here that I can expect to earn. Hey, 48, 460 annually, all right? For the median wages. State wages, if you're living in a state where it might be more, you can check the local salary info. Let's see about Colorado. Okay, now my high, look at this, 74.81, but median would be, uh, you know, because let me see here, Colorado is the red, so for, it's $1,000 more for Colorado, but not to compare to the high stakes. So anyway, that's the wage, and you would just say, well, I have skills as a chef, so I expect to make uh, 48, 460 a year, right? That's where the education and skills thing can be pumped up to show yourself uh, in a good way. USCIS review employment and unemployment information you provide on your form I-485. If you're currently unemployed because you are the primary caretaker of a child or elderly or disabled individual, provide a statement in the additional part. And providing documentation establishing you're the primary caretaker individual resides in your household, age. So they're gonna give you some, they're cut you some slack if you're a caregiver because that does give value. And so it's a little different from being completely unemployed. Okay, form I-140 approval, that's not relevant here because we didn't file an I-140. Okay, item numbers twos and three. Indicate whether or not you have graduated high school or earned an equivalent of a high school diploma. Okay, my screen's a little big or whether you have a higher degree. If you did not graduate high school, list the highest grade completed. Also, list all educational programs you attended in the space provided, such as high school, college, or other higher education. 
Provide the name of the program or school, the degree or certificate received, if any, the field of study, and the start and end dates. Enter your degree program start date and end date in the form of month, day, and year format. If your degree program does not start and end on a specific day, provide your best estimate of the day. Just fill in some, just some number. Or you won't get in trouble. If it is available, you must provide evidence of any degrees or certifications received, such as transcript, diplomas, degree, trade, profession, certificates, or equivalent. If this evidence is unavailable, you should provide an explanation and, if possible, evidence of unavailability, such as a letter from the issuing institution. Foreign education should include an evaluation of equivalency to education or degrees acquired at accredited colleges, universities, or educational institutions in the United States. I'm going to say this again. This is so burdensome. Foreign education should include an evaluation of equivalency. For lists of organizations that provide equivalency evaluations, see the National Association of Credential Evaluation Services. There it is. Uh, I like WES. That's a, that's a good one. W-E-S, Credential Evaluation. There we go. World Education Services, WES.org. There you go. You can get a credential evaluation here, pretty cheap, uh, and they're good, and they work online, and um, that's the equivalency if you're going to show them a degree. And we want you to show them a degree. We want you to show them a degree. If you got a degree, send in the degree and get it, the equivalency done. Okay, item number four, occupational skills. List any relevant occupational skills, including any certifications and licenses. When these were obtained, who issued the certification or license, license numbers, and expiration renewal date. This includes, but not limited to, workforce skills training, licenses for specific occupations or professions, and certificates documenting mastery or apprenticeships in skilled trades or professions. If it is available, you must provide evidence of any training, licensing for specific occupations or professions, and certificates documenting, documenting mastery or apprenticeships in skilled trades or professions. If this evidence is unavailable, you should provide an explanation and, if possible, evidence of unavailability, such as a letter from the issuing institution. Okay. Occupational skills. So, you know, you might have occupational skills, but you may not have attended classes. You may have just worked with a mentor. So you want to prove your occupational skills, right? And if you don't have any, um, see it's called, this includes, it's not limited to workforce skills. So you have workforce skills, that what you've learned, training you've taken, right? If it is available, which you will make it available because you get a letter from the person who taught you, Right? You must provide evidence of any training. So a letter talking about your training is going to be evidence. So you want to do that. So if you've worked, you want to have, and a variety is good. So if you've done childcare, babysitting, if you sold soda on the corner, if you've run a little store, if you have worked as a shade mechanic, if you've done whatever it is you've done and you get a letter from someone saying that they trained you in doing that, that's going to weigh as a positive in your case. So you're going to want to get that occupational skill piece. Everyone's done work and everyone should be valued for the work. Here's how we do that. We have to have letters from people. English and other language skills. Okay. Provide information on certifications or courses in English and other languages in addition to English. Provide any evidence of language certifications, including any language or literacy classes you took or are currently taking or other evidence of proficiency. Native English speakers or other language, if applicable, must provide documentation of language proficiency, including language certifications. Evidence of language certification may include high school diplomas and college degrees showing that the native language was studied for credit. Right? So, English. If you don't speak English or don't speak English well, they're going to hold that against you. There will be a negative on you around your use of English. So uh, knowing how to speak English, then you have to 
document that you know how to speak English. And if you've never, if you don't speak English, you should get into a class, right? You should take a class and show them that documentation at least. Okay, and then the retirement, and that cuts us through all of the uh, levels of this form. It's deep, isn't this crazy? So, okay, so here it is, the I-944, here's the form, and information about you, okay? And so you are the immigrant, and who you are, covered this, your household, okay? Individuals on your household, we've talked about that, same as the I-864. Question about, do they live with you? Is this individual filing an application for an immigration benefit with you, or has this individual already filed an application? Right. So indicate that. Total number of household members, including yourself, right there. Then you and your household members, assets, resources, financial status, okay? So we start with income, name of the household member, did you or your household member whose income is being included file a federal tax return? Did not file, select a reason. And you have these reasons. And other here, federal tax year. Total income from tax return or item one on W-2, wages, tips, or other compensation. Put that number there. Explanation for not filing. Little, little box in there to fill out. And then other household members. So for me and a spouse, then it's just be the two of us. Um, does any of your income from your household members come from an illegal activity? Illegal gambling or illegal drug sales? I hope to say no. If you answered yes, how much do you make from that? It's kind of funny. Does any income? Public benefits. Okay, here's the public benefits one. Hopefully that's no. And then if it is yes, you put the number in there. And then if you or your household members receive additional income on a continuing weekly, monthly, or annual basis during the most recent tax year and the income is not listed on the tax return, provide the amount of additional income. For example, child support. Attach evidence of the additional income. In addition, if you are a child, list any additional income or support available from your parents, legal guardians, or other individual providing at least 50% of your financial support that is not listed in their tax return. Okay, so then this is the other income, other income, other income. And then is it illegal? And then your household's assets and resources. We talked about this. Name, cash value, amount. Liabilities and debts. Go through those. Credit report and score. Do you have a credit report? Yes. No. Provide a credit agency report that demonstrates you do not have a credit record record or score. So this is what I was talking about. You're going to go and, you know, if you don't have a credit report, you don't have a social security number, you're going to have to uh, make inquiries on your credit report in writing and uh, pre present evidence of that with your application. Do you have a credit score? Probably no. If you have negative credit history or a low credit score in the United States reflected on your credit report, provide an explanation. For guidance on what constitutes negative credit history, please see the instructions. Okay, so there's going to be that. They want information on that. Verify for bankruptcy. All right. Bankruptcy filings. So Donald Trump would have to put his stuff in there. Do you currently have health insurance? Yes and no. You don't really want to say no. You know what I mean? Try to file this thing with saying yes. Get some health insurance, even if it's crappy health insurance, even if it's um, you know a church-based policy, anything. Just get something down there to give you some way to weigh in your favor on health insurance. Okay. All the answers to that, and it's a lot. It'll be covered in the instructions. Public benefits, again, if you've gotten any of this, uh, it's not fatal, but it's going to be hard. Uh, disenrolled, we would probably go with uh, wanting you to disenroll from the public benefit. But, you know, 
That's a whole separate conversation. You and your household assets, resources, financial status, okay. Uh, more public benefits stuff. And then there's some of the ways you can take public benefits and not have it be hurting you are listed there. Um, and then we're going to go to more public benefits stuff and withdrawal of applications. And then we go into the fee waiver. We're applying for USCIS benefits. And then the benefit number, the, the fee waiver. And then your education and skills. Here we go into education. Do you have an approved form I-140 as an alien worker? Probably no, because we're doing I-130 marriage-based. Answered yes. There's a receipt number of no. Go to number two. Have you graduated high school or earned a high school equivalent diploma? All right. Hopefully you say yes, because you're providing information about your education, occupational skills, and other related information. If you need additional space to complete any item number in this path, in this part, use the space provided in part nine additional information. And I'm probably going to just write up a letter, a good letter, a solid letter with attached evidence, just laying out the whole educational, occupational skills piece because it's really where you can score points, where you would put in my skills here, and then I would say, uh, I'm expected to earn this much in the, on the O-Net, and just lay all that out. But the form asks for high school, and then list your educational history below, degrees attained, and um, program and school name. Occupational skills, here we go. Yes. The occupational skill, bricklayer, date obtained, the date, who issued your license or certification, if any. All right, you probably won't have a license or certification for a lot of this stuff. And what I would say is I'd say the name of the person who wrote me the letter and license number, and I would just say not applicable, right? And just get that information really clear. And then expiration renewal date would be not applicable as well, if it's just basic work experience. Now, English language proficiency. So provide, now if you're speaking more languages, that's great because even if you don't speak English, but you speak six or seven languages, you're gonna look really great, right? So even your local languages, um, lots of countries have local, regional, tribal languages. If you know those different languages, um, lay them out, show that you're a language person. But they're not gonna have certifications for that. But your letter could also Talk about language, and, and you could have a letter from someone saying, I know that they can speak seven languages. And that's going to help in this piece. Retirement, are you currently retired? All right, and that is it on the 944. Isn't it brutal? You go through the declarant statement, contact. Here's all the stuff down here with the credit agencies, interpreter certification, preparer's form, and the signature. Uh, Prepare a signature at interview, too. So they're going to have you sign this at the interview. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for watching video number five, a big video on affidavit of support issues and declaration of self-sufficiency. Now, the next video, video number six, is going to be all about assembling your packet and getting everything together to mail in. So look for you on the next video. Thanks for watching.